Would you welcome Mr. Fred, please? I'd just like to say two things to begin with. One, uh, I am absolutely delighted, and I'm sure all of us are, that Wallace Ben has been appointed a bishop. Uh, what, whether, whether you, yes, that's right. It really couldn't have happened to a nicer chap, and more well deserved, and that's terrific. Secondly, I'm, I've got a gammy leg, and it doesn't, it's all right, but it doesn't bear standing on for hours on end, so I'm sorry I, I'm doing this sitting down, which I don't normally do. What do you do when a polite, pale-faced boy in his late teens stops you on the street and asks you for money? Politicians talk about zero tolerance, and they tell us that it's all their own fault, and that, of course, relieves our conscience. But if there are not enough jobs to go around, is that their own fault? And if their mother has taken a new man who has thrown them out because they can't find a job or they can't bring in social security so they don't bring in any money. Is that their own fault? When I went into business in the mid-50s, we were all committed to full employment. Never again was Britain going to have dough queues and starving poor. Unemployment, believe it or not, was only a quarter of a million and that was mostly people in between jobs. Now it is two million in good times and three million plus in bad times. Two million at the height of a pre-election boom and up to an over three million in bad times. In some council estates, in our big cities, it is as high as 50% and among those who've just left school, it's as high as 70%. Now when I was in public service in the 60s and 70s under the Wilson and the Heath and the Callaghan governments, full employment ranked as an equal priority with all the other economic objectives. In the 80s and the 90s, no one seems to care. Even the new Labour Party, which as the old Labour Party held to the cause for so long in opposition, it seems to have abandoned full employment in favour of keeping taxes low for those who are still at work. But I don't know that we should be too hard on the politicians. Politicians are simply a reflection of the voters. And the majority of voters are comfortably in work and no longer feel the care we all had for those who are out of work. For a party who, which wants power, it is the comfortable majority that matters and we live in what the great uh, economist uh, Galbraith called the culture of contentment. We're content, whatever happens to anyone else. So we should be honest with ourselves and ask, what has changed Britain into a selfish society, from a caring community into a callous community in a single generation? The 60s. The decade of the permissive society was, I think everyone agrees, when Britain changed direction, when our country formally abandoned the Christian moral order as a guide to our law and our custom uh, that make up the social order. To quote a repeated refrain from the book of the judges, everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. And as a result, then as now, was moral and social chaos. Look at the end of the book of Judges and you see the moral and social chaos there. As the wise King Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. The immediate objective of the 60s was sexual permissiveness. But if you're doing, if doing what you're like is all right in the bedroom, well, why not in the boardroom or why not on the shop floor? If people are assured by the secular humanists that, uh, that are our guiding lights today, that this world is all that there is and that you, what you get away with in this life you can never catch up with you afterwards, then you grab what you can, while you can, however you can, and hold on to it as hard as you can. Until the 60s, the trades unions used the bargaining power of their stronger members to help their weaker members. Solidarity was the watchword, but towards the end of the permissive 60s, solidarity cracked those workers who could hold multi-million production lines to ransom grabbed what they could for themselves 
and the union leaders were powerless to, to help those who fell behind, the nurses and the teachers and the shop workers, powerless to help those who lost their jobs and the bosses to protect their companies, demand the big plants, uh, swapping people for online computers, outsourcing instead of making things themselves, and downsizing to make an end of job security. So the bosses hit back, and the TUC and the unions could do nothing about it. Unemployment and the fear of unemployment once again dominate British society. A powerless TUC lost 4 million people down to 7 million people in, uh, since the end of the 70s. And the welfare state too has suffered from voters' insistence that taxes can only come down when they need to go up, as even the Economist, a right-wing weekly, admitted in its recently in its first leader. In the early 80s, government filled the gap left by lower personal tax by raising VAT, shifting it, of course, to those who, hit, who, who were poorest, and hit, they got hit hardest. They used up all the revenue from the one-off bonanza of the oil surplus. As that surplus ran out in the mid-80s, uh, they started uh, the selling off the nationalized industries, as Harold Macmillan said, selling the, national silver, selling the family silver. And in the 90s, despite raising VAT again, uh, they made their way by heavy borrowings, which in the last seven years have doubled the national debt. That's how they have got by, by keeping taxes on personal incomes low and the rate of surtax low. Now, the problem is that a nation that is too greedy to pay its way in taxes for what the government spends has to borrow. But a nation that plunges into debt is a bad risk and it has to pay higher and higher interest and rising interest rate force companies to cut back on vital new investment and that is what we need to balance our trade and expand our employment. So if that investment is cut back, we cannot balance our trade, we have a heavy external trade deficit as well as the internal deficit and uh, we cannot expand our employment solidly because we do not have a solid basis of industrial investment behind it. The crunch will come with European Monetary Union. If we join that, that will of course force us to join those who discipline their borrowing and give their citizens an honest currency and we will then get a competitive interest rate. But in the meantime, in the meantime, if you look at The Economist again, the risks of investment in sterling, which is not joined to any other currency and therefore is a risky investment, uh, force British companies to pay 45% more to raise money for investment than Germany, France and Holland, our main competitors. The countries also most committed to monetary union. So those countries who are our main competitors for exports and jobs they uh, can put down 45% more investment in new products than we can for the same interest cost. Now that's a very technical point, but it's a point that is absolutely essential to make because people who tell you that it's all all right, it is not all all right if you have to pay 45% more for your money to put down the investment that is needed to expand our exports and enable us to expand our labor-intensive industries like construction and that is absolutely critical to the expansion of today's uh, today's industry now i make these technical points because they all arise from the very basic point that governments feel that they cannot do what they ought to do because they have been forced to go to the polls promising no increase in taxation it is totally absurd there are those who cover the thing up by wrapping the, uh, wrapping the uh, Union Jack around the pound sterling and making a great thing about that, but the pound sterling has uh, dropped. It doesn't help us. It has dropped to uh, a fraction of what it was in the early 60s. You could buy a car for 1,500 in the early 60s that now costs nearly 2,000, 20,000. 20, 20, so that is the extent of the depreciation of the currency uh, since the permissive society went. And people who say all you need to do is stick to sterling, well, we can see what's happened when we have stuck to sterling. 
Now, I don't want to get too much into that. It's a highly contentious subject, and maybe you have views about it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the quickest way to put Britain back to work again is to lower our interest rates, get our big companies to, in to invest, expand our industry, and expand the rest of the economy with it. That is the fastest way back. If we don't do that, then the alternative is, and if there is an alternative of course, the alternative is to raise taxes, pay our way, lower interest rates, and over a very much longer period, we will begin to get people back to work again. That is not a very attractive proposition, but the fact is that at the moment, we pay 26 billion pounds a year to pay people to do nothing. That is a dead weight. That has squeezed out all of the welfare part of the government uh, expenditure. It is the only bit of expenditure which really should come down and could come down. It's the only by getting rid of that that we can actually in the long run have lower taxes. But therefore, the selfishness that boxes the two big parties into a corner is absolutely folly on a grand scale. Because of that selfishness and because of the grip of its nationalist wing on the Tory party, full employment, which should be the central issue, is not even on the election agenda. We have a very marginal election agenda when actually we've got a colossal problem. We can run out of money, two million unemployed, rising debt, foreign trade imbalance, and no way forward. Now, the cover-up story uh, by those who want to pander to our selfishness is that the global, global market economy makes a full employment policy unrealistic. That is complete rubbish. Uh, I was only 39 when I started in British Public Service as a chief industrial advisor. I'm one of the few people left around who has experience of what is necessary for full employment policies. And until 1979, it was simply a major factor in e British economic policy. It was behind uh, the drive for a high rate of industrial investment to back the export drive and give us the steady trade surplus on which full employment depended. So it was woven into our policy. Uh, you adjusted other policies to take into account the fact that it was a major feature of post-war British governments that we should keep people at work. It's not the world that has changed, it is Britain. Uh, since 1979, we have simply let all that go. And um, from a Christian point of view, it seems to me to be absolutely essential that we hold on to this, that God has made every single person um, in his own image. He's given people uh, the duty to work. It's in our basic nature as people that we want to do something worthwhile. Now, maybe, you know, you have a dreary job and maybe you don't like what you're doing, but to feel that you're totally marginalized, that nobody in the country wants you or cares whether you're there or not, it is totally undermining to human beings. And we should not let it happen. People need a stake in society. They need a place in society, and we cannot throw them out of society. So now that the money has run out, it is absurd for the two major parties to pretend that we can carry on as if the lush flow of funds that they had in the 80s and early 90s carry on forever. We're a small nation. We're 1% of the world's population. We have 10 times the average income, and we live in our wits. So moral folly, treating people as if they can be thrown out of society, two million people thrown out of society, nobody wants them. Moral folly is also economic folly, and both the moral folly and the economic folly will find us out. But bad though that is, it is, uh, it, it is uh, not the worst result of our disastrous secular humanist experiment of the last 30 years. That experiment, which is only an experiment, one that nobody has ever done before in any country, has in three decades destroyed the institution which is foundational to all societies, all cultures, all religions, throughout human history, the family. The permissive society was founded on the arbitrary decision taken without any proof 
that the mutual obligations of the family between wives and husbands, parents and children, the wider family too, can be safely dispensed with in the cause of personal freedom. And the result has been absolutely unprecedented social chaos. Last year's official figures published in the government document Social Trends, they show the cold statistics. Nearly half of new marriages are now ending in divorce. We don't, of course, have the figures for those cohabiting, but I imagine that they are higher than half. 80,000 children a year have to face the trauma of abandonment by one parent, normally the father. There are now 160,000 abortions a year. A third of couples living together don't even bother to make the legal commitment to each other. Each reserves the right to walk out, and so that destabilizes their partnership from the beginning and makes a split even more likely. Now, in the last four years, I've been going around our major cities to encourage the churches and the missions to form networks in each city to help each other to deal with a tidal wave of personal disaster that has resulted from this lethal mix of high unemployment and the destruction of the family. And we have, uh, we have found that uh, every single place you go to, um, they, they, there is this tremendous problem. The result of the new sexual freedom is very, very one-sided. It needs a very hardened mother to lose the instinct to protect her small children. But if she tries to hold the family together, uh, then the man can walk out at any time. And so to keep him, she has no more power than a mistress used to have. Indeed, if she has children, she has less power than a mistress. And too often, like the mistress, she finds that she has to do whatever her husband wants or lose him. So much for women's rights. 90% of lone parents are mothers. So it is very, very one-sided. Society talks about civilized divorce. But the tearing apart of what we as Christians believe God has joined together as one body is as painful and as bloody as tearing off of a limb. And those who have to deal in churches with, uh, with abandoned spouses know the loneliness and the trauma, the depression and the bitterness. There are big council estates where half of the mothers are single parents and the other half live in unstable marriages without the old security. A staffer uh, on the steps of the Edinburgh City Mission and the Piltdown Estate in Edinburgh said, just look at the people passing by and see if you can find one happy face. You know how you have a crowd, there's normally a bit of cheerful chat chatter in the crowd, not there just absolute gloom passing this way and that way. Another result is the rise in child abuse within the family. Uh, when so many children taken into care that the system of childcare is no longer reliable. And there is a pressing problem of abuse of children in care. The churches and the missions say that almost all the teenagers on the streets are there because of a row with their mother's new man. And the new class of teenage prostitutes, they have left home for exactly the same reason, abuse by their mother's new man. Unwanted and unloved teenagers, dropouts with nothing to do and all day to do it in, have created a huge increase in crime, which has risen 10 times since 1951. And 40% of the offenders are under 21. Crimes of violence have gone up dramatically in the last 30 years and people in the cities no longer feel safe on the streets. Now the pushers are selling drugs to children and many take them as the only way out of a pointless and grey life. But drugs have to be paid for and so on many council estates everything worthwhile has been stolen and large areas of our city are no-go areas for the police. If you say that to a policeman he will not deny it. Unemployment and the breakup of the family have made a lethal cocktail and we have not felt its full damage yet because with each generation it gets worse. Not only does the rapid rise in crime come from this lethal mix, but so too do most of the other problems that stretch our city churches and the city missions to their limits. Debts to loan sharks, battered wives, teenage pregnancies, teenage homelessness, 
and the depression and the confusion that comes from aimless, unstructured lives in an atomized and lonely society, not to mention those who uh, have been returned to society which does not want them. We asked somebody in the crypt in Leeds, St. George's Leeds, what about those who are returned, just returned to the community? He said, what community? There's no community there waiting for them. One of them who sometimes comes to our church in Cambridge told me he was having trouble keeping digs. I said, why? He said, because I'm violent. I can't help it, but they don't like it. And those people are just being pushed out and have to fend for themselves. So everywhere I go today, I find churches drawn in often and willingly to look after today's equivalent of the Bible's fatherless and widows. And they're drawn in for the same reason as the Good Samaritan who bound the wounds of the traveler on the Jericho Road and paid the innkeeper to look after him. For the same reason that Jesus fed the hungry, healed the sick, the lepers, the lame and the blind, even though he knew that when they heard his teaching, they would turn away from him, or most of them would. It was simply that the love of God compelled him. And if we really have his spirit in us, it will compel us too. And yet there are a lot of uh, religious people, including many evangelicals, who, like the priest and the Levite, uh, still pass by on the other side. They, they argue that it's uh, our task in the church to preach the gospel, to save sinners for eternity, not to solve the problems of this passing sinful world. But we have not just one commandment to preach the gospel, we have to keep both the commandment to preach the gospel to all the world and the commandment to love our neighbor, which, as Jesus said, summed up all of the law. And uh, the two great commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, that sums up the whole of the law and the prophets. And the apostle Paul echoed him, keeping the one command to preach the gospel does not excuse us from keeping the other. Why should it? When the welfare state took over so much of the church's care of the needy, uh, there might have been some excuse, but the permissive society has broken the welfare state and the church door is once more the place of refuge for those in need, and so it should be. So it should be. They should expect to find love when they come to a Christian church. They should expect to find help for the helpless when they come to a Christian church, because that's what we're taught to do. When our Lord was asked what the first commandment was, he quickly added the second, to love our neighbor as ourself. And then when asked another time um, by someone who wanted to limit the number of neighbors, who is my neighbor, he then replied with a parable of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritans were a despised race, they were a heretical religion, and yet the Samaritan helped the wounded Jew. Whoever we find in need, who cannot be helped, unless we help them, that person is our neighbor. And we have a lot of neighbors who cannot be helped unless we help them. And what compels us is God's love, which he gives to all true Christians. It was the love of God that sent Christ to the cross to die for us, even though we were rebels against him. It's the love of God that makes us want to share our faith with others, uh, and which compels the church to carry out the, the, church, the Christ's last great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. But the love that makes us reach out with the gospel to save their souls for eternity, it can't be divided from the love that wants to help them in their desperate plight here and now. God made both the body and the soul. They're both his. Christ cared for the people of his time, body as well as soul. He couldn't separate them. I care for your soul, but not for your body. He couldn't separate them, and nor should we. And if we don't care for the needs that they feel, how can we expect them to believe in the need of their souls, which they don't yet feel? And if they don't see the love of God in us, God's messengers on earth, how can they believe the heart of the gospel, God's love which sent his son to die for them? They look to us, and they want to see love. And they want to see love in a way that they can understand. And if we don't care for our fellow citizens, we create a vacuum, an opening for error. And uh, the church in the last hundred years has created a vacuum 
until a hundred years ago, the time of Shaftesbury, we were quite clear that our job was to look after people around us. Shaftesbury did that, all the great 19th century reformers did that, but then we got gathered up into a kind of pietism. The liberals came in and they took over our job. And then we looked at the social gospel, which they were preaching it as a gospel, which of course it is not. Uh, and we said, oh, well, that's something for the liberals and not something for us. But what has happened is that there is a great vacuum now in the public perception of the position of the church. And into that vacuum has come the permissive society. Into that vacuum has come nationalism. Uh, into that vacuum has come all of the cults. We need to be four square in the center of society dealing with the problems that society has as it sees them. We've always done that through the centuries. We need to be doing it again today. So we not only need to recover our confidence in the authority of the faith that we hold, and I think we have now recovered that confidence, but we also need to recover Christian teaching about our duty as citizens. God has put us here. We're in a democracy. We're part of the power structure. We all have votes. We are citizens. We are not out of it. And let's look at the plain teaching of the scriptures on our need to look after the people around us. James says, chapter 2, verses 4, 14 on, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith and has no deeds? Can such faith save him? If one of you says, keep warm and well fed and does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. That is to say, it's no good to us. It's not true faith. And uh, we need also to look at what Paul says, because um, the great 16th century Reformation brought us back to the doctrine of salvation by faith only, not by works, but by faith. So works were slightly downplayed. But look at what Paul says. Although he says, not of works, lest any man should boast, that's salvation. Um, he also said in his trial before the governor Festus, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and show their repentance by their deeds. That is what the Puritan ethic is. It is showing that you have repented by what you do afterwards. That what you do doesn't save you, but what you do is an indication that you are saved. In fact, it is the indication that you are saved. Christian teaching is, we can't be saved by our works, but only by faith. But it is the Christian's deeds that show whether our profession of faith is true or false. Works are not the cause of salvation, but they absolutely have to be the result. That is the basic of the dynamic Protestant ethic, uh, which has given us so much in this country for so long, uh, which pulled all Protestant countries, including Great Britain, up by its bootstraps. It is what Christians converted out of Catholicism, what they began to do that signaled that there was a fundamental change. And when we come to the great day of judgment, of course our sins will be covered by Christ's righteousness, but read what Christ the judge tells, tells us that he will say on that great day of judgment to many who profess to be Christians, he will say. And these are chilling words. Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. And they will answer, when were you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or in need of clothes or sick or in prison and we did not help you? His reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Some commentators uh, say that the least of these um, 
the, the previous passage adds, my brethren, and that the care is limited to those in the church and to those not outside it. But if you're in any doubt, you have to take scripture with scripture. Christ gave help to those who would not accept his teaching outside the faith. The story of the Good Samaritan defines our neighbor as to whoever, whoever needs our help. And Paul, look at Paul himself, the great evangelist. He looked after his shipmates on the voyage to Malta. There were criminals, sailors who tried to abandon the ship to drown, let them drown, soldiers who were only just prevented from butchering them, and yet Paul carefully advised them against sailing, prayed to God for their safety in the storm, encouraged them to get back to man the ship by telling them of God's promise that their lives would be saved, was alert as nobody else was alert to the attempt of the sailors to leave them, and made them eat a square meal before they got on shore, uh, before they had to swim for it. And once ashore, he helped to gather sticks for the fire to dry them all out. That is the great evangelist, greater than we will ever be. That is his care for those who are around him, and they certainly were not members of the church. So we really can't escape that chilling warning of our Lord. God's church is not a cozy club like-minded people, as the world would like to think. It is the instrument, the instrument, of Almighty God, Creator, and Redeemer, the sole instrument by which He communicates with the world. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, the outward and visible evidence of God and His character, uh, the bearer in all we do as well, as well as in all we say of His message to men and women, light in a dark place, salt in the corruptible carcass of our human society. And in a society of total self-centeredness, such as we live in now, love shines out firm and clear. We have got to let it shine. And for the service of love, he has given us all the power we need and all the gifts. And Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 13, that the greatest of these gifts is love. God showed us his love by sending his son to die for our sins, even though we'd done nothing to deserve it. Even the sins of Saul of Tarsus, who was persecuting the newfound church, God still came to him. So we have to reflect that love of God by showing it to those around us, to our neighbors in need to those who will not be helped unless we help them. Now, the world may argue against our teaching. It is much more difficult to argue against pure and selfish love. Hatred against Christians is not so much battered down by argument. Hatred against Christians is melted by love. When people started to die of AIDS, the chief constable of Manchester, a very loudly professing Christian, said that they were perishing in their own corruption. In the same city, a team of Christians have been looking after those dying of AIDS, living all alone, deserted by partners, deserted by the family. To which of these do you think those folk want to talk about life after death? Those who love them. Not all of us could sit with those dying of AIDS, but not all of us should. God gives us different abilities. Uh, those who started the project said they turned down far more people for that project than they accepted because it was a very difficult project and not everybody could do it. And not everyone has the physique of the burly Scott in charge of an overnight shelter in Aberdeen. And we asked him, you know, what happens if there's trouble? He says, if there's trouble, they just throw them out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not all of us have been bred to command, like the four square woman from an old county family, daughter of a judge, uh, who was running a youth, youth club in, uh, in Clapham. And when they came in with a, uh, a knife, she said, no knives in here, no knives in here, give me your knife give it to back afterwards, <laughs> and they all trooped in, all handed in their lives, and afterwards she gave them all back. You know, you need, some, you need some bread to come on before you do that kind of thing to skinheads. But on the other hand, on the other hand, the club had a very gentle young man who taught them how to make canoes. So we all have different gifts. We all have different gifts, and we mustn't think that because we don't think we have the gift of dealing with these, some of these things, we don't have any gift at all. We all have some gift. And in most people in need, they're not threatening, they're pathetic, they need hot soup and shelter and clothes, someone to sort out their debts, get them out of the clutches of the loan sharks. 
show them what they can do best if they haven't got a job, give them the skill and the self-confidence to apply for jobs, to listen to the tearful teenagers who found themselves pregnant, don't know what to do, to help children from noisy and overcrowded homes to do their housework, homework, uh, to look after the very young latchkey kids before mum comes home. But of all, in this hard, bleak, selfish world, they need love, the feeling that somebody really cares and will take time to listen to them. Now, we all feel pressed for time, but I've found in a very busy life that if God calls you to do something new, he always points out some current activity which takes up more time in those words, even if it's only cutting down on the time you spend in front of the box. At the very least, we can pray and give for the state of our nation, the state of our city, and the work which others in the church are doing. We should all be concerned in one way or another. Last February, I visited a Baptist church in the back streets of a northern town. It had about 300 members. It had grown to that. And not all at all well off. I mean, it was not in a plush suburb. It was down the back streets of row houses. Uh, yet, five days a week, it had a playgroup, uh, to which a great many single mothers came with their children, a job seekers course for the unemployed, a cafe used mostly by older people living alone, and a bookshop, and each activity was one paid worker helped by volunteers, and all that on top of the ordinary work which it had for young people, its own young people and any others who came along. It raised from its members alone 300,000 pounds for building extensions needed for these projects, including a basketball hall. And what they can do, we can do. If we don't have 300 members, then we can get together with other churches, we can pool our resources. If we're determined to do these things, they can be done. People who do not have a lot of resources are still doing them. And I've come across other things all around the country. And the motive from which Christians reach out to our neighbors is love. But that also has an important side effect. It gives the church credibility in a democracy. And in a democracy, it is the opinion of the people that eventually count. If we live in a hard society, we have got to try to make sure that it does care for its neighbor. And we do that, first of all, by example. And that example actually does have an effect. I once opened a church on a housing estate that was in the mayor's ward. And as we sat together beforehand, he said, I don't know what these people teach but I know what they do for our kids, I know what they do for our old folks, so I'm here to listen. And the politicians today do not know what has hit them. What they do know is the awful problems that they face in their council wards and parliamentary constituencies. If you go and talk to them about that, they don't lecture you about the permissive society or any of those theoretical things that the, that the uh, secular humanists talk to us about. They are just extremely grateful that you're helping them with what they see as an impossible problem and doing it in the spirit of love. So they listen to those dealing with the problems who tell them why it has gone wrong. They listen to people on the ground in their own patch who will tell them what has happened to their people, why it has gone wrong. And uh, we will not change uh, secular society by, uh, uh, by argument alone. Uh, but we have this invincible weapon of Christian love. And that is what 2,000 years ago defeated Greek philosophy. It defeated the pagan Roman Empire. Uh, it, uh, after that, it, uh, it converted uh, the barbarian invaders, including our own Anglo-Saxon ancestors. And the same love and action has gone with Christian missionaries all around the world. It is our duty to challenge politicians in the next six weeks when they come to our constituencies to ask for our votes. So we ought to put full employment. We're citizens, we've got to vote. We ought to make sure that full employment goes on their agenda. Um, most people, far more people turn up to this kind of meeting than turn up to any political meeting, I can assure you. So they don't get very many people to their meetings. And if you turn up and you ask them awkward questions, you will, get, you will, you will be heard. But perhaps put not too much of your trust in princes. Uh, Christian love and action is the only weapon uh, which can really be relied on to save our country, and that is our weapon, and that is up to all of us. So. Now we have
have about 10 minutes left for questions. There's a roving mic going around uh, somewhere or other. If you want to ask a question, please stand and wait for the mic to come. Could you put your hand up if you want to ask? There's one here just to the front. Um, I found your talk quite challenging, but as a young person, um, I have a big concern over Europe. I was in an evangelistic bookstore on my campus at UMIST, and we display Adrian Hilton's book, The Principality and Power of Europe, and this person came from and laughed a bit at it, and he said, um, he thought maybe it'd be a shallow book. He can be forgiven for that, he knew a lot about European history, I don't know very much about it. I'm and sorry, so I, I, for some reason or other, I can't hear you terribly well. Could you speak a little bit more slowly and distinctly? It's, sorry. It's, it's this kind of echo that comes up here. <laughs> Which would I face that way? Okay. Try um, again. I had a, a non-Christian come to my bookstore on campus, the evangelistic bookstore, um, and he looked at Adrian Hilton's book about the principality and power of Europe. Um, he's done a lot of work, research into European history. I've lived abroad outside Europe, so I don't know much about it. Um, he was slightly mocking, and I said, what would it be like if the Roman Catholic Church was the state church over Europe, had big influence? And he said, if it's anything like the history, it'd be horrible, and then spent the next half an hour telling me about it, and I managed to tell him that Christianity was about relationships, not about church abuse of power, to draw him to Christ a bit. And I would like to know um, from that, if you think that the Pope is an antichrist, oh, right. and, and I would like to know um, why, uh, in my council and everywhere else, we feel very strongly that we should leave Europe and it's bad for us, and it's, you know, it's, if you want to bring law and order back, I'm sure Europe will bring it back in an authoritarian kind of way that we've seen in Europe in many centuries gone by, um, and why is it that the church isn't debating this issue? Because most Christians I know are really concerned about it. And I wrote a three-page letter saying I'm very confused because my coin says the queen, by the grace of God, highest authority in the land. And the European courts say they're higher authority. And, and all I get is a, a two-paragraph reply and no debate. And it doesn't leave... You know, I would like to see that Christians disagree, but we can debate um, it as well. Uh, is, what do you think? Uh, I need to de just get one simple question out of that, and the only one I can get, actually, because it's all I can hear, is, is the Pope the Antichrist? Is that the guts of your question? Hmm? That, yes, that was yes, that, he that said was the it question. Is. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, that wasn't what I was talking about, actually. <laughs> Shall I answer that one, or go on to something that was on my subject? Well... Um, the last person to uh, ask me that was the Reverend Dr. Ian Paisley. He said, Fred, do you believe the Pope's the Antichrist or do you not believe he's the Antichrist? <laughs> <laughs> now, my view on the, uh, on the book of the Revelation um, is, is that uh, um, what the book of the Revelation warns us about is the spirit of Antichrist. And I think that it's very dangerous to pin that to one person. Because if you pin it to one person, if that person's dead or that office goes, then you forget about the spirit of Antichrist. This was uh, something that was uh, written to uh, the churches at that time. At that time. The spirit of Antichrist, as I understand it in my interpretation of the Revelation, is the, the uh, unholy alliance against true Christians between state and the official church. Now that has happened right through the centuries from the beginning of time to now. There was a time when the Church of England, with the great respect to the former bishop, uh, and the coming bishop, <laughs> you know, uh, there was a time when the Church of England was persecuting Christians with the backing of the state. Now that is the spirit of Antichrist. Now we live in a different world. There are other countries where the Christians are dreadfully afraid that the new people in Eastern Europe, uh, the new governments are going to gang up with the Orthodox Church and persecute the Christians. And most certainly, of course, uh, the Roman Church ganged up with the Prince Bishops to persecute Christians. So I think that it is something that can happen anywhere. Uh, now, if you, uh, if you then say, well, how is that relevant to today? I think the main places that is relevant today are actually Eastern Europe simply because uh, the Catholic Church is, has got very, very little remaining political power. I know that by talking to my MEP friends who are Catholics, who despair of the fact that the Catholic Church has lost its power, but the fact is that it has. 
And it's lost its power partly because the world has become secular and it can't stand up to it, but also because um, uh, Europe, that is the Council of Europe, has a declaration of human rights and if you want to become a member of the European Union you have to sign that declaration and that declaration guarantees freedom of religion. So for the very first time we have religion all through Europe and indeed even countries like Ukraine have signed up to this declaration of human rights which guarantees freedom of religion. So I regard Europe the fact that there is free movement, that there is freedom to preach the gospel, freedom uh, to, uh, to do all the things that we want to do, I regard this as an enormous opportunity. It's an enormous opportunity. If St. Paul had taken the view of some of the Eurosceptics, he'd never have replied to the man from Macedonia. <laughs> okay. I think there was somebody over there who wanted to ask a question. Uh, could you keep questions brief now and to the point? Thank you. At the very beginning of your talk, you referred to people who are comfortably in work or something like that. But my understanding is that people who are in work aren't comfortable. They're overworked and they're very insecure of their jobs. Um, what's your view on this, please? Are, are you saying that there is work for all who want it? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying that, that those people who today are in work, who are employed, are not comfortable in their jobs. They're not sure that they will have a job this time next year, for example. Oh, right. And so that they're insecure in their jobs. That's one point. The other point is that I see people being under tremendous pressure yes. at whatever level of work they're in. Yeah. They're, they seem to have too much work and there are not enough people employed to help them out, this sort of thing. Yes. I just wondered what your view on that was because you were using the word yeah. about... You seem to be uh, contrasting the poor unemployed you know, yes. the unfortunate unemployed with the comfortable, those who are comfortably in work. And I'm just not sure what you mean by those who are comfortably in work. Well, I mean, I, I of course agree entirely with what you say. Not only has, uh, is there a very large amount of unemployment, but the degree of unemployment and the possibility of unemployment is being used by uh, owners to, uh, um, to, to cut back on their obligations to the people who are, uh, who are in work. Uh, when I was uh, in business, uh, which is not all that long ago, um, it, uh, you know, if you were a good manager, you tried to keep together a good team and you tried to encourage them and you tried to build the relationship between them. And the last thing in the world you would want to do was to make them feel jumpy. Nowadays, um, that has gone completely. And what I ask myself is, uh, you know, how can you have any morale in any group of people if the fat cats at the top are creaming it off and taking it out on the people down at the bottom. You can't get any morale. It's a complete morale destroyer. If we're going to compete in a tough world, then we have got to have good teams. Good teams need good leadership. Good leadership means a degree of security and trust between people. And I think what's happened nowadays is appalling. In good management terms, it's appalling. Okay. One last question. Just here. Yes, Sir Frederick. Um, we seem to have fewer committed Christians in politics than in previous years. I'm not sure whether that's true. Yeah. But I'm wondering whether there's any plan of action, perhaps from people like yourself with experience, to get some of our younger university Christians uh, ready for going into a life in politics. Do we not need many more committed Christians in yes. our Houses of Parliament? Well, I, I think, of course, uh, that it is a very desirable thing to have committed Christians in senior positions wherever they are and senior positions in politics. Um, what I uh, think has gone wrong with British politics and may be put right um, is that we have now career politicians who go in when they're young and have got no other job to go to, uh, nothing to do if they're thrown out, and so they lose all their independence. I think politics used to be people who had some experience in the world, some, some money behind them because they'd got, or some trade union behind them, you know, somewhere they could go back to so that they were not so totally dependent on getting government jobs. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that the atmosphere of, uh, of, uh, that we find in the House of Commons now, where everyone gets whipped into line in a party, is, is very antipathetic to the independence that a Christian would want to show. I think that Christians should go into politics, but they have got to retain some independence when they do go into politics. 
And in the House of Commons, there's very little of that independence at the moment. If we happen to have electoral reform, then I think some of that independence will come back. Most other countries have a separation of politics from government that does not, encourage, does not allow government to bribe politicians elected to look after their own interests to bribe politicians with the offer of office. But uh, A, certainly people should be in politics, but B, they need some independence, I think, if they're going to do any good there. We have about two minutes left. If somebody has a very brief question. Yes, just here. We're keeping our good microphone man fit. Um, you suggested before um, your reservations about the possibility of civilized divorce. The possibility of? The possibility of civilized divorce. Oh, right, yes. And um, seem to cite that as one, at least one contributory factor to juvenile delinquency. Mm. But I'm not suggesting that divorce is at all desirable, but is that situation, that scenario not preferable to a scenario where there is great angst and hostility and possibility of physical abuse in a marriage that was not that was not really made as a covenant before God anyway? Yes, uh, that of course is the argument of people who are in favor of divorce, that uh, it's much better to have divorce if the marriage has come apart and people are battering each other in front of the children. Uh, the f uh, there has been some recent research on this, I can't just lay my hands on it, but the research says that children would prefer to have a father and mother still at home even if they did have rows. That was the answer of the research, and I can understand that. Uh, but of course, the other answer is that they shouldn't have rows. I mean, you know, you shouldn't let it get to that. If, if divorce is more difficult, uh, and it's not an option, then, uh, then, then uh, quarrels have to be settled, and people don't take action from which there is no return. If you have a secure marriage, a really secure marriage, a secure legal system where it makes it difficult to get out of the marriage, then, then these things don't come to that pass. It's like trying to keep friends. You don't, in the end, want to fall out with your friends. You don't, in the end, want to fall out with your husband or wife. So I don't really accept the argument that it's better to have divorce. Well, I'm afraid our time is up now. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Can we again express to Sir Fred our gratitude for this? Uh, uh,